Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about all things Beatles, anything about the past, anything about the present, any part of their history or their music we cover here on this show. All things are up for grabs on this program. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of this program, also known from my other Beatles show, the syndicated show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my regular co-hosts of the show, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And uh, one of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, who's been with them since the very beginning, since the inception of Beatle Fan, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we also have our resident musicologist and freelance writer who also writes for Beatle Fan, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On the show this time, we have a special guest with us on the phone, and that's Lawrence Juber. Lawrence is known to Paul McCartney fans around the world and Beatle fans for being the last lead guitarist in Wings. And he played on the Back to the Egg album, was part of the 1979 UK tour. He was on the live hit for Coming Up, and uh, he was basically with Paul for the good part of uh, three to four years with Wings. And he's got a brand new CD out, and it's called Fingerboard Road, and we're going to be talking about his new album and also his time with Paul. So let's welcome Lawrence Jubert to Things We Said Today. Hi, Lawrence. Hi there. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Let's start the conversation by talking about the new album, which, as I said, is called Fingerboard Road. The album has uh, 13 songs on it. There's uh, three originals and there's 10 covers. So I want to start by asking you the question, how do you uh, normally pick the songs that you cover on your albums? Are they personal favorite songs or are they songs where you can hear yourself bring an interesting arrangement to the song or both? Well, both for certain. And also, you know, with, with input from my wife, Hope, who has to listen to me working out the arrangements of these things <laughs> and, and is also my producer, my co-producer on the projects. So she'll chime in with suggestions and sometimes I'll just sit down, pick up the guitar and, and start playing something that will just kind of come from somewhere deep in my memory and, and it'll turn into an arrangement. Other times I'll, I'll specifically pinpoint a song because there's some kind of resonance. I mean, for example, you know, I did Go Now on this album which when I played it with Denny Lane on a TV show in London in 1977 was functionally my audition piece for Wings. Mm. It, it's kind of, you know, there, there are different kinds of resonances that happen. I mean, I, I have, um, you know, the, I did Angela, which is better known as the theme from Taxi, uh, mm. which is a, Bob James tune, and that's just this kind of like proto, almost proto smooth jazz, but in the days when, when they were actually kind of still using pretty adventurous harmony, and that and and Steely Dan's Peg both have a very kind of mid seventies kind of vibe about them that uh, is really kind of part of my musical background where. At that period, I'm mean, pre Wings. I was a studio musician. I was listening to a lot of kind of West and New York fusion type stuff. You know, big fan of Weather Report, Return to Forever, music like that. And that that particular kind of harmonic vocabulary and melodic sensibility really kind of resonates with me. And so there's a nice challenge in making a guitar arrangement that's going to be satisfying in that particular genre right okay hmm. we're going to do this like a round table so each of the guys will ask you a question who wants to go next i can all right uh, al. hi lj how are you tonight oh i'm a little fried i was at abbey road on the river you just came weekend. back from abbey road on the river that's right that's yeah. right how was yeah, how that was, was that uh it was fun and, and just by pure coincidence um that yesterday was this 36 anniversary release of back to the egg right and mm-hmm. i happened to be on stage with steve holly singing some wing songs from back to the egg so it was kind of a uh, fortuitous occurrence there mm-hmm. and we had old phil Enzi, who's a great sax player who actually played on uh, jet he played baritone sax on jet he played the sax on on al stewart's hits year of the cat and time passages on 
so I, I co-opted him to play on orchestra. So we uh, wasn't exactly the grand rock orchestra, but it was nice having a, a sax on that tune. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned, uh, you just mentioned playing Go Now with Denny in 1977, how would you compare doing that song that way in 1977 to what did you bring to that song on this new album? Well, what I try and do when I'm doing a solo arrangement is to be true to the spirit of, of the record typically true to the spirit of the record. Now, of course, you know, my interpretation of it draws more on having played it with Denny and, and with Wings mm -hmm. uh, than, than the Moody Blues original. Sure. Uh, so there's an extra dimension that comes into that. But really, it's just, you know, I think for me, these arrangements often are, are just the art of the possible. It's finding that place in the musical where that nexus of the music the fingerboard the guitaristic sensibility and just what's physically possible on the instrument to articulate something that really communicates the essence of the song but also gives me in this case and, and in fact for the whole album a little bit of room to stretch out there's a more mm -hmm. improvisational aspect to this album perhaps than than some of my previous ones in fact, most of my previous ones. Right. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, I took some liberties. Uh, you know, there's there's you know, there's room to play some solos. But, you know, the, the, I'm still always trying to find the voice. I'm trying to find the way in where that melody sits and, and, and to put everything else around it, put the bass in there, get that especially with with go now because it's kind of it's a waltz you know mm -hmm. it's in it's in three time which is kind of unusual for a rock song yeah and uh, even though it has its r b roots so that kind of thing just was uh, was kind of a nice challenge because it has a lilt to it but it's not a it, but you know lyrically it's not kind of a happy song it's actually a very it's a very sad moving kind of song but it's you know it's in waltz time and it's in a major key mm -hmm. so there's this kind of this interesting interplay between the the emotion of the song and the natural kind of tendency to make it happy um so that's you know part of the challenge is to kind of keep that bluesiness in there and try and catch the way that denny sings that opening phrase mm -hmm. you know that we've mm -hmm. already said and you know to get just enough of a bend in there to to really make it cry Mm. And, and that that's the kind of stuff that I just try and kind of really personalize it and guitarize it at the same time. Exactly. I just want to say, it's, it's Alan Cozen, um, I just want to say, speaking as a guitarist, that the playing on here is really stunning. And, uh, you know, in, in particular, uh, the, the live cut at the end, um, love at first sight, really beautiful. Um, but the, the, track I wanted to ask you about actually is the first one without a net which is I guess at least part of incidental music that you wrote for a play that your wife has written and is going to be I guess repeated in June um, in LA I think yes. and um, I think Part of the thing about that play is that um, although it's it's got a script, there's some improvisatory uh, aspects to it as well. Is that is that the case? Yes, it's it's a, a scripted play that's set in an improv workshop. So mm -hmm. there's a teacher and ten participants, and in the course of the play, you learn about the characters and and their. The interplay, but when they do an improvisation exercise, it's most of the time that's actually improvised. So mm -hmm. it, it's never the same way twice. That each mm -hmm. time you see the play, the improvisations are different. And but the improvisations, unlike a normal improv show where you might have you know a group like the Groundlings or Second City, uh, you know the famous improv groups who will you know create a scenario and improvise within that we have the in this play that you have the scenario but the the improvisations are done from the perspective of the characters and 
in the course of the improv, there, there's, there are certain things that they have to accomplish in order to satisfy plot points that you know, cover the broader, uh, the broader range of the script. Mm -hmm. And this particular piece that I wrote is, is the kind of the theme song. It's the, the introductory piece of music. And it was, you know, so it was kind of commissioned. I mean, I'm, I was producing the show and I am producing the show uh, for, for this run also. So it was, it was something that I wanted to give Hope something that would, that would kind of establish a certain kind of tone. Um, mm -hmm. And because, you know, um, the, the show has a certain amount of risk to it, that what I wrote kind of puts me on the edge of being able to improvise and being able to kind of like, you know, get out of the improvisation and back into the kind of quote scripted or the, you know, the composed part of it um, mm -hmm. and be able to, to really kind of uh, have that, uh, that, that kind of quality that the title without Annette, because which actually refers to a woman's name, Annette, but it also is a play on words because it's like when you improvise, you're working right. without a net, without right, right. support. Mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. and I've learned a lot over the years from working in theater. And, you know, I, at one point, I, uh, Hope and I both took some improv classes at the Groundlings. Uh, and she's taken a lot more uh, improv than I have, but I just took a few classes. But I learned a lot about music improvisation from working in that kind of environment and from watching actors improvise. And in the course of the play, at the end of the play, they, the class do their do an actual improv show. And I'm involved in that. So when they're improvising a scene, I may be improvising underscore or stings to go along with it. So mm -hmm. there's this interesting interactivity. And I love the ability to be able to stretch out away from this pure fingerstyle guitar kind of the, the, the calculus and the algebra and the geometry of the whole thing, which is very, can be very regimented because, you know, in, in what I do in doing my arrangements, especially you know, when I'm doing like, you know, classic songs like Harold Arlen songs or in the case of the new album, Georgia on my mind or, or doing Beatles songs where they're, they're very, very specific and very, very calculated ways of, of getting around the arrangement and the performance of it. I mm -hmm. like the fact that in this context, I can play a lot looser and I'm not, I'm not restricted in the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's also been fed into by over the last few years playing more electric guitar. I've been getting back into that mm -hmm. and, and what that does, you know, cause I, as a teenager, I was not, a, my goals were to be a, a studio guitar player a blue, an articulate blues, bluesy rock lead guitar player and a fingerstyle guitar player, all on kind of parallel but interrelated tracks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was the lead guitar thing that got me into Wings, that and the versatility. Uh, but the fingerstyle guitar thing is really kind of what got me post Wings into actually developing an artistic voice. And over the, the course of the last few years, the, my last album, Under an Indigo Sky, had a certain amount of improvisation in it, but I've gone that much further with this new album. And, and I, it seemed appropriate to put Without a Net as the first track because it kind of just set up a particular feeling and a particular tone and the sense that there were some risks being taken. Mm hmm um, I was going to ask you, in fact, about electric guitar because uh, the the albums are, are primarily acoustic, well, pretty much entirely acoustic, um, and it is so different from what you did in Wings, um, and it's a, a different type of playing. But I know that as a studio guitarist, you must have done an awful lot of both, okay. and I was I was wondering if you if you had in any way sort of missed the electric guitar side of your of your career. Uh, I've, I've certainly missed it in terms of the performance aspect because it's just so much fun to get up on stage with a great rhythm section and you know other guitar players or keyboard players or, or horn players and just have that kind of group consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been I mean, in the studio. I've done qu quite a lot of it, and I you know I've done done now four. I produced four albums for Al Stewart, uh, his last four studio albums of which three of those are pretty heavily electric guitar oriented. The first one was almost exclusively acoustic. 
but but there's been a, a fair amount of electric guitar in there and of course you know over the years playing on tv shows like home improvement mm -hmm. and roseanne and and stuff like that where you know the electric guitar was a fairly prominent voice although in home improvement there was also 12 string acoustic was a, was a voice in that but but you know i it, it i get to do it to some extent and I really enjoy that, but it sure is a lot easier to be just going out and gigging as a solo. I mean, the mm -hmm. economics of it make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's like do it being at Abbey Road on the River and playing, you know, playing an electric set or a Beatle Fest or you know, I mean, I get to do that stuff often enough that I I still kind of keep it keep it up. And you know, I, I we have backyard jams at home, and mm -hmm. I'll go out and do jams around the LA area. I mean, one of my favorite people to play with is Albert Lee, who was one of my heroes as a teenager. And, you know, it's just so cool to get up and get into this, you know, fiendish, like electric guitar picking mm -hmm. in the circumstance. And I'm very fortunate that I get to play with and, and share stages with some, some of the greatest players. So uh, you know, one is always learning. I'm always learning. And, and it's, um, it's great to have that kind of breadth of experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so over to Steve. Well, I was going to ask, um, Lawrence, the song that really kind of surprised me, but also delighted me was Won't Get Fooled Again, because I'm, I'm a big <laughs> Pete Townsend fan. And I've heard Pete's acoustic versions, but I'm wondering what inspired you to do that. It sounds, it sounds wonderful. Uh, well, thank heard it. you. You can actually blame Martin Lewis for that. Um, <laughs> because he called me up and said, We're, I'm producing a tribute to Pete Townsend. Pete was getting uh, uh, the Tech Awards, which is uh, kind of the Music Technology Awards. Uh, mm -hmm. They were giving him the Les Paul Award, which is uh, you know, kind of a, for notable musical stuff. And, and, you know, Pete, having been a pioneer in the 70s, a real pioneer of music technology in terms of using, you know, synths and and sequ early sequences and and all the stuff that drives, you know, songs like Baba O'Reilly and Won't Get Fooled Again, those, you know, really doing very, very adventurous stuff before anybody else really had kind of grasped the potential of that technology. And so Martin had asked me to make a contribution to this this event that he was producing and i i chose to do won't get fooled again because i i you know was going through my favorite who songs and realized that the intro to won't get fooled again with that that kind of synth obligato thing mm -hmm. is something that i could i could emulate on acoustic guitar but in the tuning that i use for a lot of stuff which is dad gad tuning um mm -hmm. and and so, which was really funny because I played, the first time I played it, Pete was in the audience. And I think he was kind of baffled by how I managed to pull that off. Because <laughs> I got a note from him afterwards. He was very enthusiastic about it. And it just, it went over well. And I just kind of, I kept doing it in concert. And it just has become kind of a big concert piece for me. So I figured that, you know, it was absolutely worth putting on the album. And uh, it's always great fun to play. And I get to do some windmills and, you know, <laughs> but, but I yes. think that part of I, I and this is, this is not just true for that song, but it's true for a great deal of what I do that I discovered some years ago that, that dad, gad tuning, D-A-D-G-A-D -A -D, is, is very, very useful for arranging pop and rock songs and standards for that matter. It does things that standard tuning doesn't do and mm -hmm. allows me to do stuff that would more naturally come to a piano player or to somebody that was arranging for you know a, a bigger ensemble in terms of the way in which the the string to string relationships work the way in which i can articulate melody and bass at the same time and how all of that stuff fits together in a very satisfying guitaristic way that allows me to realize the kind of deeper complexity of, of, of these tunes and, and create something that actually is very performable too. And it just has become kind of part of my voice. And, and so to find an iconic tune like Won't Get Fooled Again and have it work in that context 
it's it's really kind of part of a big part of what motivates me to keep doing this and coming up with with cool and interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Ken? Yeah, I want to ask you about Dadgad in, in just a moment, but I also want to bring up the song Without You, because, uh, you know, certainly Beatle fans are aware that the band Badfinger originally did it, and of course Harry Nilsson had a huge hit with it. Which version were you most familiar with, and what made you decide to record that song? I think I, I knew the Nilsson version more than the Badfinger version, because the Nilsson version was the hit, the, you know, and one still hears it on, on the radio. Um hmm. But I did reference the Bad Finger version. Uh, that one actually is the only tune on the album that is not in Dagad. That's in C G D G A D, uh, which is a, a kind of a dropped version of Dagad. The bottom two strings drop down, and it was, I, I think, it was really Hope's idea that that would that would be one to do. I mean, but I readily concurred because it's just such a great song, and it has it's so. It's such a dark song, and and the history of Badfinger, you know, the guys that wrote it, and also of Harry Nilsson. I mean, it's it's so tragic, you know. Mm. The, the, and, and so to be able to to kind of dig into that into that emotional space with it was an interesting challenge. And and guitaristically, I mean, I'm I'm in that tuning, but I actually I play it in the key of F. Which was an interesting, um, interesting thing for me to do because I'd never done an arrangement in F in that tuning. More typically, I've used it in the key of G, C, C minor. I recently did an arrangement of Alfie that's in B flat. But that tuning is is kind of an interesting challenge, and that piece was a challenge. But um, I, I felt good about the about how it, it ended it ended up. But, but I think just it's it, it's just that whole kind of tragic um, underscore to it all. Right. I mean, Badfinger was such an incredibly talented band, and they were just they had so much incredibly bad luck. And yeah. uh, and of course, we lost Harry Nilsson way too soon as well. Oh yeah. But um, talk about Dadgad. Is is this? Can you tell something in the tone of the guitar when you play? in that style um and talk more about you was saying that it's more flexible uh when well, you're doing arrangements see the, the originally david graham who is credited with developing it english well british um finger style guitar player uh, a very um, very revered player in mm -hmm. the english folk scene um, had developed it as a way of, of kind of using it as a drone tuning so he could jam with Moroccan musicians. Um, hmm. And his most famous piece is Angie, which Paul Simon covered, uh, mm -hmm. which is actually in standard tuning. But but there's a direct link from Davy Graham through to Jimmy Page using Dagad. And, you you know, like a Kashmir, for example, is in that tuning, which again relates to that Middle Eastern kind of vibe. But... Mm. Um, and and Bert Yanch, John Remborn have used it. A lot of Celtic guitar players have used it because it has a very open kind of uh, modal quality to it. Because it's a suspended tuning. There's no. It doesn't say tell you whether it's major or minor because it's D A D G A D. So it's like a D suspended tune uh, uh, chord if you just strum it open. But I just I, I got to a point after my second album. Uh, which would have been about 1993, where I was kind of being encouraged to explore altered tunings. And I had played with Dagad a little bit as a teenager, but just kind of playing around with the droniness of it. And one day I was sitting in a hotel room in, in Portland, Oregon, and I just challenged myself to try and figure out what it was that I could use it for. And once I realized that I could just apply my my regular musicianship to it and just get used to the notes being in different places i then started to explore how the the string to string relationships and the intervals and how things were accessible in ways that they weren't in standard tuning for example you have three d strings you have two a strings so octaves are very easy to accomplish in mm. that tuning but but there's also you have two adjacent scale tones, so you have a G and an A. So if you go to a an adjacent string 
and then add, let's say, an F to that, you can play F, G, and A, three adjacent scale tones on adjacent strings. And that opens up all kinds of possibilities for, for, for the kinds of fingering patterns that allow notes to ring into each other, or, or chords where uh, a minor chord and a suspended fourth would coexist, which you know, opens up the vocabulary more and becomes the the way of approaching the guitar becomes more like what a piano player can do because on a piano every note is accessible to you on the guitar right. you have to kind of find those notes and they the same note might be available in in three four different places um, in Daggad it opens up different kinds of fingering possibilities and somehow it just kind of falls very naturally into a place where pop songs just live, you know, and, and I think the, the, the real, the real moment for me was, was doing Strawberry Fields Forever. And I'd been working in Dagat at that point for about five, six years. But when I realized that that tuning and Strawberry Fields Forever were just kind of made for each other on the guitar, it really kind of opened me up to even more possibilities with it. And I just figured, well, I, I'm going to stick with this as my other, my other standard tuning. And um, it's really become a very useful tool, but it is a tool. And, and I'll readily go to standard tuning or some other tuning if, if it's appropriate. Uh, I'm, I'm not like dad gad monogamous like that. You know? I use it <laughs> okay. probably for about half of what I do. But it gave me, it helped bring out my voice. I think I'd already started to establish a voice, but, but that just, it took it to another level. Very interesting. Okay. Go back to Al. Uh, I can tell you firsthand, having seen you perform Strawberry Fields Forever a couple of times, it is jaw-dropping. It's so good. Well, thank you. And, uh, and also, I was very glad to hear you mention this, the kind of... Uh, feel of tragedy that that surrounds without you uh you know even to the point of the the fact that mal evans produced not without you but produced other tracks on the album that, that it comes from the bad finger album that it comes from straight up or no dice it's, excuse yeah. me <laughs> yeah. no dice but that i've always felt that it, that there was this kind of feeling of uh, just kind of a, 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 a very sort of fatalistic feeling around that song. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I was interested to mm -hmm. discover, I didn't know that Gary Wright played the piano part. Neither did I, as a matter yeah. of fact. <laughs> no, I never, I never knew that. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, now, you mentioned the fact that uh, you've you know, recently gone back to playing electrically. And I saw you at the fest for Beatles fans in, in Rye, New York, in, uh, back in March, and saw you do Johnny B. Good. I believe it was Johnny B. Good, if I remember correctly. Yep. And yeah, that's that, kind of one of my party pieces. <laughs> okay, and I, you know, I, I, th I think it was because you were you were kind of vamping because I think you you guys were waiting for Mark Hudson to show up. As a matter of fact. <laughs> But uh, um, had you had you performed that uh, in a while or? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that that's kind of a regular tune for me. The one that I had done earlier, I think it was on the Saturday. I, I, I did a yeah. I sat in with with uh, Jeff Slate and his band Birds of Paradox because Steve yes. Holly was playing drums. Mm -hmm. And I had I've done an, an arrangement, a, a different kind of arrangement of Arrow Through Me that I sing where I've taken it kind of more bluesy than Paul did it. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I always thought that that was a really cool song and it kind of had to, to my ears, it always had potential other than the way that Paul did it. Yeah. Um, and actually I just found out, I had no idea that uh, the R and B artist, Erica Badu had actually recorded a whole song using the groove of, um, the, the actual Wings recording of, of Arrow Through Me, using the intro of it as a loop that she wrote the whole song to. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and then there was some other rap guy had done, um, had used the intro to Old Siamsa. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting wow. how Back to the End mm. kind of, it kind of crops up in, in these 
interesting contexts, you know. Hmm. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but the fact is that, uh, you know, I, Johnny Be Good for me was always one that I, I would do because I, I could remember the words. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really starting to kind of push myself more. I'm like at Abbey Road on the River. I sang. I also did um, We're Open Tonight and, and Spin It On. Oh wow! And I love Spin It On mm. because it's just this this really cool punk rockabilly piece. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of energy. Yep. Alan? You recently did uh, an interview, a video interview for Fretboard Journal. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned was that during your wings period, you were, to, to quote what you said, watching and learning and realizing how an artist like that functions. And I was wondering, how does an artist like that function? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a very <laughs> long conversation. I mean, basically, you know, I hadn't, I, I mean, I had gone to London University and I had a degree in music and I had, you know, these three, four years of, of solid studio work under my belt, but I had never really just had the luxury of being able to watch somebody on that level, you know, developing material, having the same kind of interaction that, that I was getting with Paul and and seeing how he would approach things and you know like the 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 very first session that i did was for a song called same time next year mm -hmm. and you know he had we recorded it and it was and that was my first session uh, steve holly and i both of us our first session with wings and and we recorded it and it was like okay well you know now we're going to put strings on this and it's like seeing that process at work and then going up to scotland you know, and we'd done that song, which was kind of a big movie type feeling to it, kind of very cinematic, uh, even though I never got actually used in that movie because uh, I think Marvin Hamlish ended up scoring it. Um, mm. But then the next thing we did was the song To You on, on Back to the Egg, which was, you know, very edgy. And the range, I mean, going from doing some, you know, very big kind of my love type you know, cinematic McCartney song to doing this very edgy kind of punky rock thing was a, a such a strong contrast. And then in the course of recording, like there was one day where Paul said, you know, we're not going to work on the album today. I want to do some Rupert demos. And we spent a day demoing songs for, you know, this proposed Rupert the Bear movie. And it was just how broad in his case how broad his palette was mm. and how easy it was for him to switch gears from one style to another and and because there was this kind of uber consciousness of this artistic consciousness that wasn't just driven by being in one genre but by by being an artist and a musician and a multi-instrumentalist and a producer and and being able to wear many hats, some of them at the same time. Uh -huh. And being in the course of it, I mean, you know, one would assume that there's a, you know, there's a very strong ego at work there, which there is, but but a very collaborative ego too. So it was, you know, a head that wore many hats, but it never really felt like it was too big, as it were. Mm. And following through on the metaphor. Yeah, I, w I was wondering how collaborative that ego was. I mean, you, you were used to as a session musician being, and, and, and certainly also as one who, who reads, um, being given a chart and this is what you play and this is when you play it. And and that was really the, the job of, of being a session musician. But in a band like Wings, how much room did you have to create your own lead lines or did, did he suggest more or less what he wanted were you did you did you feel free to bring your own ideas to the to the tracks there was a lot of freedom i, mean, I think that you know being a studio musician had trained me in coming up with parts coming up with guitar parts because mm -hmm. even though even though very often you're, you're handed something that's written there's also a certain amount of freedom to kind of invent the in-between licks or just find exactly the right rhythm groove or whatever. And, mm. and with, with wings, there was, there was, the freedom was there. I mean, there weren't that many occasions when Paul said, you have to play this. Mm -hmm. Now there were certain times, for example, you know, with the riff to old Siamsa, I mean, that was written into the song. Um, right. 
or you know the basic kind of groove of, of spin it on but when it came to the solos for example i was given really a lot of leeway and i was very happy to to have that uh, mm -hmm. and and that really continued i mean there were only a few occasions where paul said i want you to play this and that was you know times when things had been written in they were really part of the song like um there's a in uh, daytime, nighttime, suffering. There's a little guitar lick that he said, "I want this is what I want," or you know, and coming up, this is the guitar lick that the, that the whole thing is based on, and and so you know, that's compositional rather than more kind of musical direction where the, there's that certain freedom to be able to inject your own personality. Mm -hmm. I think the area where I I felt like I was pushing the envelope was more in terms of the live show, because Paul's not big on, you know, kind of extended guitar solos. So I really had to kind of pick my moments and, and really try and kind of put my voice in there in my own way. So when we did Let It Be, for example, I wasn't trying to be George. I was trying to, you know, bring my sensibility to the solo on that. Uh -huh. um, you know, so... But in the studio environment, I mean, I really felt that the freedom was there. And, you know, and the reality is, if you didn't get it right, Paul could always pick up the guitar and do it himself. Right. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Steve? Are you surprised that, uh, uh, just getting a little more general with Paul Lawrence, are you surprised he's still out, uh, to use the phrase of the, uh, the, the uh, tour, out there? Are you surprised he's still going uh, as hard as he is? Not really, because I think he loves to perform. The, that I think he just, he, he really, that's always, you know, being on stage is just so much built into his DNA. And I think that, you know, I mean, one could look at it that maybe there's a sense that if not now, when? Because, you know, if he stops doing it now, he's probably not going to do it again in five years. I mean, you know, let's... Just keep going while, while the going's good. And he's got a big machine set up there. I mean, once you put that machine together, you kind of you want to keep it oiled. Otherwise, you know, you have to start over. And it's not easy to to put together a show of that scope and to have, mm -hmm. the, you know, to have such a tight band and, and such a tightly put together stage show with all of that rigging. I mean, I can't imagine how much how many man hours it takes to to put together his you know, his staging. Uh -huh. um, right. And, you know, I think it's just, it's working. So why, why not? You know, and it's not like he has, you know, whereas in 1980, it was like, you know, oh, we got busted in, I got busted in Japan. Now, you know, we don't want to take the kids out of school. I don't want to be, you know, dealing with, you know, immigration and all of that stuff. And he didn't travel for another 10, you know, nearly 10 years. Whereas, over the years, he kind of gradually started to ramp it back up, and now, you know, it's this is what he does, and and I and I think it's great that he's doing it, and he's you know he's certainly satisfying his audiences. He puts on a great show, and there's no shortage of material. You know, he's never going to run out of tunes to play live. <laughs> that's that's absolutely that's, true. That's... Ken, Lawrence. You were just talking about how, you know, in your view, you, you looked at Wings as being a very collaborative type of effort. Do you separate the Wings period from post-Wings, Paul? Is it all? There are some people who think no matter what, it's Paul's music no matter what. And he still could be collaborative with all the people that he worked with on all of his solo albums anyway. So do you, do you view the, the Wings period as being something that is separate from everything else that he did in yes. his post-Beatles career? And why? Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, because in my view, Wings was not Paul's band. It was Paul and Linda's band. And, and as much as, you know, Linda made her contribution in, so, in some very specific ways that, you know, I, I found her to be very much part of the rock and roll heart of the band. Because Paul can go in a very pop direction. And, and the reality is that, you know, Wings' biggest hits in the 70s were pop hits. You know, whether it's, you know, listen to what the man said, let him in, my love. You know, this wasn't the, the big hits weren't really the hard rock side of the band. But Linda kept kept things rocking from my perspective. 
And her voice was also a very integral part. Hers and Dennis and Paul's voices blending were very much that strong backing vocal sound that you identify with those hit records, just as much as you know the sound of the Bee Gees records or or 10CC or those bands in the 70s that used uh, the that used a very strong uh, vocal ensemble sound, um, mm. and so you know she was very integral to it. Even though she got a lot of criticism for her you know, supposed lack of musicianship, she made up for it in other ways. And I think that by the time we got to Back to the Egg, it was, I think she was starting to disengage because, you know, James was, was a baby. She now had four kids. They'd done the big world tour thing. And then Paul getting busted, it, which, of course, I mean, came after the album. But it, it just it, it was a progression to the point where Wings really ceased to become that entity. And then Paul went on, you know, to be doing Paul records. And yes, Linda may have been involved, but it wasn't the same level of involvement as with Wings, where she was a constant presence. So I do, I do find that there's a, there's a difference between those. But, you know, I can only ultimately speak from my own experience as far as that particular era, the, the, you know, the egg era. You know, mm. I, I, you know, I consider myself an egg man in that. <laughs> um, but that that era was it was kind of what I describe in my book Guitar with Wings I describe it as the Indian summer of Wings that there was it was kind of Wings was was ready to wind down but we kind of like picked it up again you know putting some fresh blood in there and Steve Holly being a very different kind of drummer you know my my theory is that Paul tends to hire drummers who play more like him than like Ringo you know it's wow. like you know, Joe English was was a, a more was not a you know, an English style drummer. Denny Sywell was basically a New York jazz session player. But Steve Holly is a solid English backbeat kind of drummer and brought that kind of sensibility to Back to the Egg. Chris Thomas brought his sensibility to Back to the Egg, which is a very kind of a, a progressive conceptual point of view and and he produced that album in between doing the sex pistols and the pretenders you know so i think back to the egg kind of had its own life and we as a band we were encouraged to think of ourselves as a band and i think that that we captured a certain kind of a certain kind of quality in that album that is a little different from from the other wing stuff which is not to be critical of the other wing stuff because you know both Jimmy and Henry and my predecessors both did some fantastic work with the band but i think that back to the egg kind of exists in a slightly different space and i don't think it was necessarily fully appreciated at the time but and and the the album that followed that from Paul's perspective as far as uh, McCartney 2 was another one that was not really appreciated in its own time, but has been kind of has been re revisited, you know, because mm -hmm. what McCartney, too, did was to really initiate uh, a certain kind of sensibility that fed into the whole kind of electronic kind of uh, mode of doing things. Uh, whereas I think that what the what our era of Wings was between Goodnight Tonight coming up, which were both, even though Goodnight Tonight was criticized as being, quote, a disco record because CBS, Columbia Records, you know, called the 12-inch a disco single. In, in reality, it was kind of more like a Latin dance rock record. Mm -hmm. And coming up was a rock dance record. And there was they were kind of a little ahead of the curve of what was going on in the early 80s in terms of the way that in which rock and, and kind of club dance music converged. So there was, I think, some interesting angles that could be, you know, in, in terms of Beatleology, Wingsology, mu rock musicology, you can look at that era and kind of pull out some interesting angles on it. And I think the fact that you have people like Erica Badu and, and, you know, various rap people using loops from that album, because there was a certain kind of tone to it that was a little different from what had come before. And I think I'm I think I'm going to have to wrap it up at this point because I've got um, actually have to go and go to a rehearsal of the play that I'm producing so I can uh, take notes tonight. 
Well, thanks for your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. It's fascinating. And, uh, well, and I'm happy to, to continue this at another time. I think that, you know, there's, there's all kinds of nuances to all of this. And I'm, uh, it's part of where I live in terms of being a trained musicologist myself and, and, and a guitarist and having the kind of experience that I do. It, you know, it's the analytical aspect of it, looking at music and looking at its how it functions in its historical space is is a very um, it's just part of my musical milieu, as it were. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, it All has right. been fantastic having you here on the show. So, Lawrence, thanks so much. I want to remind everybody the name of the CD is Fingerboard Road. Lawrence, thanks so much for joining us. You're very welcome. And and people can get to my website, lawrencejuba.com. There's a link to to my online store. There's a link to my email list. And um, I I get out there and I, I do my gigs. So uh, check my concert schedule, too. All right. Thank you very Lawrence. much. All right. Thank cheers. you, Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Let me mention really quick that I print the uh, cities he's going to be in, in in the weekly calendar that I put out on uh, Saturday night. So uh, for anybody that uh, wants to know, um, and I usually put a couple weeks in in advance so you have an idea of where he's going. So hmm. there you go. All right. So we are about 13 minutes short of an hour. So what would we like to, uh, how would we like to finish up the show? You want to bring up well, some news items or anything, or let me bring up something we were talking about before we went on the air, and 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 everybody kind of reacted to it. Paul played temporary secretary over the weekend for apparently apparently the first time, and you know I I thought it was kind of you know okay. I'm I don't think it's earth shaking, but uh, I did I did notice the one video that I published was he was having a ball with it, which was kind of cool. But I'm just wondering how you guys felt about it. I think it's really well, interesting that he did it. I, I, I think it's something that nobody ever expected him to do live. A lot of people have sort of clamored for, but, you know, tongue in cheek because it, it was never expected he'd do it. Um, right. So I, I think it's really interesting that he added it to the set. I, I don't know if it will stay there or or get rotated out. But, um, you know, he has all of these songs that he's never performed. I mean, for, for a long time, he focused on Beatles songs he'd never performed. Remember when he started playing Fixing a Hole, his intro right. was that he'd never, ever played it. But there's a ton of stuff from the solo period and, and songs people like, you know, that um, that he's never done. And it, it's good to see him sort of dusting off something like this and, and playing it. I, I did see some comments from people that were not happy that he played it because they were saying, God, he could have played so many other songs and he picked that one. I mean, but I thought, you know, uh, and as uh, much as I don't particularly like the song, I thought he did a great, they did a great job with it. And, and like I said, yeah. he, the, vid the video I saw, he was having a blast. So, you know, that uh, in itself was kind of fun. And, but, and kind of apropos of what LJ was just talking about, it's, you know, it is kind of a goofy song, and it's never been a particularly a favorite of mine. But it does, as is the case with other songs on McCartney too, it does kind of, kind of show the way in a in a sense toward the kind of electronic, you know, um, synth uh, synth based music that was that was very predominant say in the first half of the 80s mm -hmm. so it's kind of of its time again it's not a you know it's not a great song but it is you know when you think of it in the in those terms in strictly musical terms it's you know it's not you know it's 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 uh where it is in the mccartney chronology is not terribly out of place hmm. well my comment about this yeah mm -hmm. um i'm absolutely thrilled to pieces <laughs> and um and in a way why why do you laugh steve because i knew you would be thrilled to pieces Th this song it, it really in some ways it's not even all that important whether i like it or not i'm more thrilled at the fact that he's doing something he's never done live before and it's not only a song he's never done live before it's a song i would never expect him to do live and, um, you know, there's so many hits he's had in his solo career that he still hasn't done live. 
There's a lot of songs that I could hear him doing live that would work well live, that were album cuts that he's never done. I could see that ahead of Temporary Secretary. I actually really have always liked the song itself. I like the production behind it. I like the quirkiness of the song and that, mm-hmm. that backwards, um, you know, the synth loop that goes on and on. Yeah. And not only that, but it, one thing that's kind of frustrating when you see Paul live is that he, he runs that, that, um, that long video of his career and he's got all this background music that he plays mm-hmm. and temporary secretary is always in there. And there's all the, all these other songs from his career that he's never done live before. And I'm mm-hmm. kind of thinking maybe this is how he gets by satisfying those fans who might want to hear those songs without him doing them live. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of songs and he, and he adds uh, you know, a dance mix to a lot of his music from different decades. And, um, you know, but temporary secretary, it's kind of interesting what Lauren said about McCartney, too, that it's kind of being recognized a little bit now as being mm. a bit ahead of its time. Because I know I had just read an article online about this and I saw one a few years ago, too, when the remaster came out for McCartney, too. I don't know if it's going to open up the whole world to that album, but it's nice to see that there are people out there in the media who are writing articles about that album and recognizing it and and seeing that Paul was a little bit ahead of the curve at that moment. And so the music on that album reflects that. It's a very, you know, down home, kind of like the first McCartney album, only without the synthesizers. I mean, the first McCartney album didn't have synthesizers. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's similar in that Paul plays all the instruments and it's got that quirkiness to it that I like. I like when Paul gets quirky and does things that are, I shouldn't even call it out of character because nothing surprises me what Paul can do. As Lawrence just said, he can, he could jump to different genres easily, you know, within, you know, from one day to the next, it's just mm-hmm. something that he's capable of doing. So, you know, I'm just really happy that he's doing anything live that he hasn't done live before. There's an article that I just saw in the last few days where Paul's saying that, you know, he doesn't mind if he makes mistakes on stage, you know, he's relaxing a lot more, Mm -hmm. he's having fun. And the mere fact that during temporary secretary, he's supposed to be dancing on stage, you know, (laughs) he should be allowed to enjoy himself and, you know, be as comfortable as he wants to be on stage and pick whatever songs he wants to do. And so much of what he does on stage is as he has put it, what he thinks his audience wants to hear. So, you know, what about what he wants to do? <laughs> sure. You know, there's, there's got to be songs in his career that he's really proud of that were never hits. And he'd love to do them live. And he probably may never get to do them live because he's got to do those iconic songs from show to show. And if you read a lot of his interviews, he says kind of the same thing, that there are a lot of people who go to see him live that are seeing him for the first time. Right. And those people are going to be very disappointed if he doesn't do Hey Jude and Let It Be and Band on the Run. And those songs, there are certain iconic songs that you expect, especially if he's playing in arenas, that he's got to do live. So for him to do anything from his solo career, especially something that wasn't a hit and wasn't on his latest album, is surprising to me. And I I welcome it with open arms. I wish he would do so much more of it. And um, I love reading how people comment to this online, whether it's on Facebook or the threads that I've read. One person said, Paul, just stick to the Beatles and your wing stuff and you'll be all right. Nobody wants to hear your new stuff. And then one person said, you know, this is so refreshing. Why doesn't he open up more and do more stuff like this? So you got different opinions no matter what, all over the world of what they want Paul to do. And when you've got a catalog that enormous, you know, and... um, you know, my big dream, which probably will never happen, but you can never say never with Paul, is that he would do more dates, play smaller venues, and go deeper into his catalog. Because I think, you know, the people who, who have bought all of his albums should matter. You know, not just the casual fans or the ones that are now discovering the Beatles, who really know him for being a Beatle. So I'm thrilled that, uh, you know, he's picked this one. Anytime he's done any song live that he's never done live before, especially if it's not a Beatles song, he just started doing Another Girl. And I love the fact that he's doing it. It's a great song. I've always loved that song. It's a song that works well live. But it doesn't, it doesn't shock me that he's doing it. But this, this kind of thing would. So I'd love to, to 
you know, see him do more songs like this, songs that, that weren't hits, even the hits that he's never done live before. Like we've mentioned here on this show, Uncle Albert out of Halsey, he's never done live. Helen mm-hmm. Wheels, he's never done live. No More Lonely Take, Nights, he's never done yeah. <clears throat> True. Yeah. Take It Away, he's never done live before. So um, there's, there's a lot of them, actually. With a little luck, he's never done live. A number one <laughs> hit like that. So I, I, I really am just very happy that he chose to do that one. Mm-hmm. Well, it's yeah. kind of, you know, again, going back to what LJ was saying before about the fact that, you know, if he were to, if Paul were to basically stop touring right now, it wouldn't be like the situation in the 80s where where he could just pick up and do it again in, in say, five years, because in five years he's going to be in his late 70s. Right. So so it is it's probably really more incumbent on him and Ringo as as well to basically keep touring and you know and and keep the keep the chops fresh you know right yeah but i i in the same vein um i know, there there definitely are people who who do see him who still do see him for the first time. You know, there's uh, somebody who's going to be seeing him for the first time with me in Philadelphia. And, you know, there, uh, you know, there are obviously songs that would be, uh, would be a disappointment if they weren't there. Right. You know, How can you so. see Paul McCartney without him doing Hey Jude? Exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Although in, in- Although the Wings Over America tour, he didn't do Hey Jude. And that was, I know he only did five Beatles songs in that Well, tour. yeah, but that was when he was still basically just doing the, doing the Beatles songs as almost a concession. Right. And he was really, really more promoting Wings. But, um, you know, it's, it, is, it is nice when he pulls out a little, you know, a little chestnut, even if it's not one of the hits, quote unquote. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that with you three guys, there's got to be a few songs from him, especially songs that weren't hits, that are mm-hmm. favorites of yours, that you feel really deserve to be recognized as being, you know, one of his best. You know, I've talked about The End of the End before, yes. which I think is, although I can't see him doing that. No, I can't. Because it's, <laughs> that's that's, that's got to be a more intimate setting. But uh, certainly in terms of lyrics, I think that's one of the best songs he's ever Yes, he's ever written. Only love remains, exactly. which he's only done mm-hmm. on, yeah, on a TV show once. Yeah, you know something like that. Uh, certainly, when it comes to ballads and songs like "Some Days" and uh, "Beautiful Night" and you know songs like those, uh, definitely. I mean, <laughs> we could be here for ten hours talking about songs we'd love to see mm-hmm. Paul do live that he's never done live before. I, right. you know, my so, my point. The point I was going to make was that I'd love to see if you assume that temporary secretary was one that he himself said, you know, the heck with it. I'm putting this in because I because I want to put it in. I'd love to see a list of maybe, you know, a few five or six songs that he would dig out of the out of the uh, catalog that he's never played that he would actually like to put in. Irrespective of whether people want them or not, just his personal favorites i'd like to see what he would dig out yeah sometimes also some of these requests come from the band Mm -hmm. oh yeah Yeah. well yeah um yeah um when um when uh, rusty was on he mentioned that there there is a back and forth with the band yeah so yeah but uh yeah i'd love to see him do, do a personal favorites kind of thing and I mean, I'm sure some of the some of those songs are, but I mean, it'd be funny to see him do get really deep into the catalog and just surprise the hell out of everybody. It would be fun. Anyway, well, yeah, but you know, one thing that I, that I really wish, along with what I just said, doing a, a tour of smaller venues and going deeper into the catalog, if he would just once do a concert where every song he did was a song he wanted to do and not care what the audience thought. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then that's not Paul to not care about right. the audience. So, but, um, you know, have a moment of, of self-indulgence there, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, you know, showcase songs that you're really proud of that the average person doesn't know. And maybe even, you know, if it's Beatles songs, you know, sometimes people, they take a look at the songs that John did and think, well, Paul shouldn't do those. 
Mm-hmm. But if he loves those songs and he's, and he's proud of them, mm-hmm. I'd love to hear him do something like Tomorrow Never Knows. <laughs> he's really, he's proud of that song. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's brought it up before. I remember uh, Will Lee talking to Paul. It might have been during the concert for New York when he was talking about the Fab Faux, you know, and the songs that they do live. And Paul said to him, really, you know, do you do Tomorrow Never Knows? Like, that's the song that he picks of all the, you know, Beatles <laughs> songs. But, mm. Like, he would be thrilled if they did Tomorrow Never Knows. So do something that you feel like doing. And, you know, it could be a George Harrison song. It could be a Ringo song. It could be anything. Do what you feel like just once. And I think the audience would get a big kick out of that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, along those lines, there's there's no reason that, I mean, if he's doing the songs uh, that he did on Kisses on the Bottom and um, mm-hmm. on, on the Russian album and things like that, that he shouldn't sing songs that John Lennon sang when he was in the band, you know. Yeah, right. Um, mm. Well, yeah, he's, done he, stra- he's, de- he's done Strawberry Fields. That's true. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so, the Day in the Life, which they co-wrote. Well, even a little Give Peace a Chance. Uh-huh. Right. That, and, he- and Help was in that medley, too. Mm-hmm. You know, and he just recently did Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite, right. which Paul said he had a little bit to do with the writing of the song, but we know it mainly as a John song. Sure. So, you know, whatever, whatever he feels like doing. My God, you know, the man is now uh, about to be 73. Let him do whatever he wants. Yeah. <laughs> it would be far more interesting to me for him to just be himself, do whatever he feels like, instead of doing what everyone expects him to do. Right. He should do side one of life with the lions, let's face it. <laughs> this is the anniversary he, week. We should he, mention that. Yes. <laughs> well, you, you know, everybody ties together life with the lions with Back to the Egg. Yes, you know, of course. They think it's those their, two anniversaries at the same time. They're linked. They're linked right. forever in history. <laughs> there, mm. there we go. There we go. It's the, it's, anyway. it's the medley of uh, two minutes of silence and spin it on. You right. Know, it, we do it right. all the time on the radio. Of course. So I feel like I, like George Burns saying, you know, say goodnight, Gracie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. let's just do that. Thanks. Thanks so much to Lawrence Juber for joining us. Again, his new CD is called Fingerboard Road. You can find out more about Lawrence on his own website at lawrencejuber.com. And anytime he wants to, he can, he can join us here on the show. He's, he's such a wonderful speaker. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. So this has been a blast talking with Lawrence and uh, doing a little bit there, talking about Paul and temporary secretary. All right, Paul. So for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels being joined by Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman and Alan Cozen. Thanking you all for listening and we'll see you next time.